I think we can start. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Bigniew Wodzki. All main steps of his scientific career are connected. I mean, studies, PhD, and professor position are connected with Jagiellonian University. His research concentrates on several complex variables, in particular on pluripotential theory. The title of the talk is Suita Conjecture and the Osavata Gagoshi Extension Theory. Please. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, program committee and the organizing committee for the invitation. And allow me to start with something that is completely unrelated to uh, this talk, but since this is a big mathematical meeting in Poznań, and this has not been mentioned, uh, I think, in the opening ceremony, and this is kind of my hobby, <laughs> I'd like to mention the fact that, in fact, it was the three mathematicians from Poznań uh, who, in effect, uh, uh, won the Second World War. Uh, and, uh, and it's not been Turing, as uh, is usually uh, uh, the person that is most uh, 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 mostly linked to the breaking of the Enigma code. Uh, let me only tell you that this was the first time ever, I think, that an intelligence agency hired mathematicians. That was in 1928. Now it's the biggest employer of mathematicians, so it's uh, everybody does it, and it turned out to be a, a well, big success. Uh, okay, uh, so today I will want to I, I talk essentially on three things. Uh, so one is a, a conjecture from one-dimensional complex analysis of uh, potential theory. Uh, formulated in 1972. The other thing is uh, the Ozawa Takegoshi extension theorem from several complex variables. One of the most important theorem in complex analysis and complex geometry. And uh, here uh, the particular emphasis in is on the optimal constant, but also on, say, a simple as possible proof of this result. And the third uh, topic is uh, not complex analysis, but it is uh, a convex analysis. More uh, precisely, the Muller conjecture, and uh, so which is still open. So the first two things I, I will actually report on the uh, proof of the of the first two things. And uh, the, the third one is the Muller conjecture is, is still an open problem. And, uh, and uh, complex, but there is a very new complex analytic approach to the Muller conjecture. And the proof of burgo milman inequality is due to Nazarov. And it, it is uh, closely related to uh, what I'll be talking about on, from several complex variables. And the link to all three of this topic is the Hermander L2 estimate for the D-bar equation. So, uh, in fact, uh, because everybody for several days asked me uh, if my talk is going to be elementary. Uh, so, of course, it's, it depends on a point of view. Uh, but, but, uh, but I think it's very elementary. Moreover, so essentially every result that, that I will talk about can be proven very elementarily using Hermander's L2 estimate. Uh, it's, uh, well, this is, this is to some extent a very recent knowledge that certain results can be proved using directly this estimate. So, so the fact, the knowledge that this result is so, 
I mean, every, well, in this area, everybody knows that this result is, is extremely powerful and it's been used in many other, uh, for many other problems. But it's even uh, with, uh, you know, and essentially every year, uh, this is uh, uh, even, even, even more so. So, uh, in a way, uh, Hermander's estimate is, is the main, could be, it, the, the talk could be well also titled on applications of Hermander's L2 estimate. Uh, so this is uh, Adrian the other day uh, said that the results that are 40 years old are very old, uh, and this is 50 years old. So the, this, this only non-elementary thing really is inside uh, this uh, work of Hermander, it's this breakthrough article from 1965, and then he wrote a book, uh, I think one of the best book ever written, it was on essentially PDE approach to several complex variables. Uh, again, both very influential till today, and uh, used also in many other areas. Okay, so let me start with uh, Suita conjecture. Uh, and the other uh, disclaimer is that I, I'm not sure if this is, well, okay, I, I will try to give you some proofs also, at least some indication how the methods works. I, I think methods and proofs are more important than statements and theorems in mathematics, so, uh, but I, will make an effort to be uh, as elementary as possible. Um, okay, so first let me formulate the Suita conjecture. Uh, so we start with a domain on the plane, uh, say bounded, or it really has to be, a do it could be even a Riemann surface that admits uh, bounded non-constant subharmonic functions. For uh, such domains, we have a uh, green function, so this is uh, a solution to this problem. Usually, so this is a negative green function. Sometimes it's, uh, mostly it's, uh, the definition is the minus of this, but for us the green function will be negative. So for a given pole z, uh, it solves this equation and it's zero on the boundary. So it has a logarithmic logarithmic uh, uh, singularity at the pole. For example, for a disk, it's just the logarithm of the modulus of z. And then we define a so-called Robin function, which is the, uh, this limit, and take the exponent. And this thing is really a logarithmic capacity of the complement of the domain. So it's a potential theoretic notion. It's not an invariant notion in the sense that if you uh, uh, make a biholomorphic uh, a map domain biholomorphically, it's not preserved, but almost, namely this metric. So with this, there is this derivative factor. So, so, so in really, this defines a, a metric on, on a, say, Riemann surface, and, and this is an invariant uh, this is also, it's, well, this is even a local invariant, so, so it's a well-defined notion on any Riemann surface that, that is allowed. Um, okay, so the, con uh, well, okay, and then we have a Riemann surface, or we have a surface, we have a uh, metric, in particular Riemannian metric, and so we can talk about the curvature and the intrinsic notion in this case. Uh, it's defined by this formula, and the conjecture was that it's the, always bounded by minus one. Okay, so basic properties that already noticed by Suita. We have equality in a disk and thus in every simply connected domain. We have a strict inequality in a non-nullus. Uh, this uh, this uh, he proved using elliptic functions. And uh, by approximation, it's enough to prove for domains with smooth boundary. Now, since, since uh, 
we have inequality for the annulus, we have also inequality for every doubly connected domain. And uh, so it's enough to prove this for, you know, multiply connected domains, starting with domain that has at least two holes. Um, and you can also show that there is, if it's smooth, then, then it, there is equality on the boundary of this, this guy. Uh, so in a way, we're asking essentially whether this curvature satisfies the maximum principle. That's the... Okay, so uh, this I kind of working on that for uh, quite a few years. I, 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 I have come across uh, literature in, and, and some lectures in applied mathematics and physics that were kind of related, and so I noticed that in these fields it's very often a, a big problem to compute a green function for multiply connected domains, even numerically. It can, it is relatively easy in the case of annulus, uh, as I said, it's using elliptic functions, so the picture you can draw is, is like that for, well, this particular annulus as a function of log z. All right. Now, for the, the, ish, the, the topic of invariant metrics in, in several complex one and several complex variables is a big one. There is a big abundance of uh, invariant metrics, and usually they don't satisfy this property that the curvature of uh, that their curvature satisfies the maximum principle. So, in particular, uh, the Bergman metric, which I will not go into details what it is, but it is an important metric in this field. The, you can draw a picture uh, on the annulus like that. In fact, it was first drawn uh, by a student of mine, Zhevomir Dinev. Uh, this picture was obtained. But uh, anyway, you see that this does not satisfy maximum principle. And most of the metrics, is, it's not the case. Now, why is it interesting? It is interesting because it's a problem that is easy to state. It turned out to, at least for people, it was formulated by people in one variable. It turned out to be difficult to prove. And, uh, and only, as I will show you, methods of several complex variables uh, turned out to work here, uh, essentially. So let me reformulate this first. Uh, it was already noticed by Suita that this uh, thing uh, appearing in the uh, numerator of the, the curvature term is uh, precisely the, the Bergman kernel on the diagonal. So Bergman kernel is defined by this extremal property so I will only use in this talk the Bergman kernel on the diagonal, but let me just tell you what, what the Bergman kernel really is and why it is called a kernel. It's a reproducing kernel for L2 holomorphic functions. Uh, okay, so it's defined by this property. And uh, uh, this, well, with some abuse of notation so that I, I'm not writing ZZ as I should have, probably, but okay, uh, since I will be only using this in this talk for uh, uh, on the diagonal, that, that, that you can, tr and, and, and you should rather think of this as this definition, as a supremum of certain family of holomorphic functions that, that will, because, why? Because uh, est to estimate this thing from below will require to construct a holomorphic function with some properties. And the philosophy, well, of this talk in particular, but I think in general you should have, that if you have a non-trivial problem to construct a holomorphic function, uh, you have to use Hermander L2 estimate. That, that at least my life philosophy. And I'm not sure, this has not been so, re I, I think, this has not been really applied in dimension one. Uh, so, in, in uh, complex analysis, uh, classical complex analysis, uh, well, which is maybe a pity, mm, but, but it, it seems that 
at least in several complex variables. But in one complex variables, there are probably other tools. Uh, but uh, in, in several complex variables, well, if a problem is really non-trivial, you, ha you have to use Hermann-Derel to estimate, I believe. Uh, I, I will talk about what Hermann-Derel L2 estimate is uh, in a moment. Uh, so, reformulation is this. So, so, we ask whether you can have this optimal lower bound for the Bergman kernel in terms of logarithmic capacity. And the breakthrough, there, nothing, there was essentially no progress for a long time. And the breakthrough came when Ozawa realized that this is really an extension problem. So you should treat it an, as an extension problem because it's estimating the Bergman kernel from below. Uh, uh, so this is equivalent to fi for a fixed z to finding a holomorphic function with prescribed value, say one, and satisfying this L2 estimate. And that's how we should think of it uh, from now on. So using a very complicated method of the original proof of Ozawa Takegoshi, he proved this, there is this estimate, but with some big constant. Uh, and well, this has been improved in the meantime. Uh, so in particular, there are these two results. Uh, all right, so that's about the Suita conjecture. Now, the Ozawa Takegoshi extension theorem. Uh, for, for, to state the theorem, I need some basic properties from uh, several complex variables. So, the first one is a notion of a plurisubharmonic function. Uh, so, for an uh, open set in CN, a function, a real valued function with possibly minus infinity values is called plurisubharmonic if it's upper semi continuous and subharmonic on every complex line crossing this omega. And the completely equivalent statement in terms of distribution theory is that the complex Hessian is positive semi-definite. This makes sense for distribution. Of course, for smooth functions, this equivalent statement. But you can also prove that kind of as a distribution, that, that's an equivalent uh, formulation. Now, a domain uh, is called pseudo-convex. This will be basic domains we'll be dealing with. If it can be exhausted by a plurisubharmonic function, uh, this means that exhaustion plurisubharmonic function means that uh, sublevel sets are relatively compact, uh, all sublevel sets. Uh, this is in complete analogy with convex functions and domains. Convex function of several variables are de defined precisely this way. We have a real Hessian here and real lines instead. And you can think of convex domains as exactly domains where exhaustion uh, func convex exhaustion function exists. But it's a much, uh, so there is a big analogy, but it's a much harder a uh, much complicated notion. Uh, let me only mention that it's still an open problem if an upper semi-continuity is a necessary condition in this first definition. Th this is in full generality still unknown. Mm. Now, so, okay, so let me uh, state the Ozawa Takegoshi uh, theorem. Uh, so we have a domain in CN and, and we have a, a, a fine sub complex subspace. So this is omega, this is h, and we so the lower so we have this lower dimensional intersection. And well, it's not. It has been known that you can extend every holomorphic function here to a to a function in the whole domain. Uh, but the point is to do it with L2 estimates, and. Uh, uh, so the result is for any such holomorphic function defined on this lower dimensional piece, you, you can find a holomorphic extension satisfying this uh, L2 estimate for arbitrary way, 
plur uh, for arbitrary pluris subharmonic weight here. So, so think of phi as zero in the most uh, important case, but it's but it's the, the, the weights here in this whole theory are important. Uh, okay, so so this is the this is the theorem. Uh, well, it has been the proof has been simplified a little bit, and uh, in particular, so we in the original statement we required the domain is bounded and the constant dependent in particular on the diameter. Sue and Bernson uh, realized that this really it has to be bounded only in in, in this direction orthogonal to the to this uh, hyperplane. Uh, so if you take, it's enough to prove it for hypersurface, uh, for hyperplane. So if this is, uh, the hyperplane is Zn equals zero, and the domain is contained in this kind of uh, uh, product, then it, it, it has only uh, to be bounded in this orthogonal direction, but it can be unbounded in this, uh, well, <coughs> other directions. Uh, and well, they prove c equal four. The the, the 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 method they use was the methods of the Hermander estimate, but not directly from Hermander estimate. So all kind of Bochner, Kodaira argue, uh, formulas and so on were still needed. Now, optimal constant here in this case would be one, and this is what I at least for some time treated as a multi-dimensional version of the Suita conjecture. Um, and for me personally, at least, the breakthrough came with a very, you know, paper by Boyong Chen, posted in the archive, about two pages long, who showed that Ozawa-Takegoshi extension theorem can be proved using directly Hermander's estimate for the Dubar equation. So there's a recent thing. I have a uh, impression that uh, some people in this D-bar business are not very happy with this paper because it has uh, simplified a lot of things. Um, anyway, I, I personally think it's great and it's been very uh, useful. Uh, okay, so now let me explain you the D-bar equation or Cauchy-Riemann equation in several variables and the Hermander estimate and why this is useful in constructing holomorphic functions. So, uh, we st so for a complex valued function of several variables, d bar of u is a zero form of this type zero one defined <coughs> this way. And uh, the basic uh, property even for distributions is that this uh, function is holomorphic if and only if it solves this homogeneous equation, like, like in one variable. But uh, the way to, 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 to uh, but the point, the idea is to really solve the inhomogeneous equation to construct holomorphic functions. So, uh, okay, so now we go to, uh, well, if we have a zero one form, then its d bar is defined this way. Uh, so this is a form of uh, degree 0, 2. And this is the inhomogeneous equation. Uh, since d bar square is 0, the necessary condition, so, so u is unknown and alpha is uh, dara, so the non uh, necessary condition is that alpha is d bar closed, uh, well, which can be written this way. So you can treat, this is really a system of n equations. Um, and so let me now state the Hermander estimate, the, 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 the main tool. Uh, so I assume omega is pseudo-convex in Cn, phi is, say, smooth, strongly, plurisubharmonic, and uh, take a, a zero, one form, d bar close, with coefficients in L2 lock, then we can find a solution to the uh, an inhomogeneous equation satisfying this L2 estimate. Okay, so we have the phi is a weight, but phi is also here. So what, so what is this? Uh, so this is precisely uh, the 
the length of this form with respect to the scalar metric defined by this potential phi, which okay, is given by, by this formula. This is not a version, so okay, first of all, Hermander's estimate was more general, was for arbitrary PQ forms, but I'd be only interested for zero one forms, the one thing. Now the original formulation was a slightly less general, there was a Euclidean length here divided by the minimal eigenvalue of the complex Hessian of phi, but it's exactly the same method that can be used to prove this result for zero one forms. I'm not exactly sure who was the first one to formulate it this way, probably Demai. Uh, and the, 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 the main point is this is a great tool for constructing holomorphic functions, even in one variable. And the basic way it works, we start with some, uh, some uh, alpha, so we start with some chi, essentially arbitrary, and take alpha this way. So then if we find a solution to, to this equation, it, the, the difference has to be holomorphic. And since you know this 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 condition, if you if you set up it well, gives you some uh, useful solutions of this equation and eventually uh, holomorphic function. So that's the basic uh, idea. Now, I come to uh, some technicalities. Now, uh, I have no time to show you how how this building up that I mentioned here worked. Uh, but my main point, that, so there will be a, a theorem that was used to prove this uh, optimal, uh, the, the version with optimal constant. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a new D-bar equation, but I, it's essentially equivalent to Hermander's estimate. So that would be my point. Uh, the, the statement is long, but the proof will be almost shorter than the statement. Uh, so we assume now that we take not just one spur subharmonic function, but take essentially any other weight. And there is this extra assumption that the length with respect to phi has to be not bigger than one and not bigger than some small delta on the support of alpha. So, so some technical Think. And then we can find a, a solution of this equation satisfying precisely this estimate. Okay, don't, you, don't worry too much about uh, the statement here, but in a way I, I, I think at least today it's a kind of most optimal result. Uh, on the other hand, essentially equivalent to Hermander's estimate. Uh, but, uh, so first of all, if you, if you take psi equal to zero here, then you can take delta equal zero, this will be zero, and you recover Hermander estimate. Uh, secondly, this theorem implies the previous of estimates for d bar in this setting with optimal constant. So I, I don't have time to formulate those, but, uh, but most importantly, this was used to, to prove this uh, Ozawa Takegoshi with optimal constant. Now, I had on the next slide, I have a proof of this, but I think I will skip it uh, just to show you that it's, it's very short. Uh, oh, that, that's the, okay, that's the end of the proof. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a very elementary proof, and the only, okay, the only, let me go back, the only, uh, the idea of the proof here is that you take a solution that is minimal with this norm, then it has to be perpendicular to the kernel of the bar because all solutions, uh, the this, 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 this set of all solutions of the inhomogeneous linear problem has to be perpendicular to the kernel, uh, so the set of solutions of the homogeneous problem. So we use this Hilbert space theory, and then we do kind of a twisting. Uh, so we multiply this by e to the psi, and we end up with a solution to a new equation, this twisted equation. 
And now this is in the, in the new, with a new weight. And then you apply Hermander and some cauchy schwarz inequality and, and, and it works. Uh, so this is a very, it's just a formal consequence of Hermander's estimate. Okay, so uh, this result was used to prove uh, this version of Ozawa Takagoshi. It's like with this uh, Sue Bernson statement, but here instead of the unit disk delta, the, we take arbitrary domain on the plane and the constant we get is pi over this, this logarithmic capacity. So if D is a disk, then this logarithmic capacity is one because the green function is just a logarithm. And uh, so this is the, the optimal constant. And for n equal one and phi, we get the Suita conjecture. Now, somehow the, 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 the main problem, at least for me, maybe I will feel a little bit ashamed to, to, to admit this, but was this ODE problem. So we have a, well, you can think of this even as a equality. So we have a, a equation, one equation, one ODE, but two unknowns. So it's not a well-determined problem. And uh, uh, and you like to find a solution on a possibly big interval. I mean, the boundary condition, well, the initial condition was at plus infinity, and you want to find a solution at uh, you know possibly big interval. You know, and it was very frustrating because taking even trivial, uh, like taking g equal to minus logarithm of t and doing you know then you get a, uh, numerically you can get the solution. You already got by far best constants in, 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 in the Suita conjecture and Osawa Takegoshi. And uh, numerically, I was able to get down to co constant, well, you require one. I was able to get to constant 1.007, doing a lot of computations on Mathematica. But it turned out that the, the <laughs> you can, so in, paper, in the paper, it takes just two, two lines, essentially, this, this part of the argument, because you can find the solutions uh, precisely, okay. Th this probably shows my complete uh, <laughs> uh, lack of uh, expertise in, in differential equations. Uh, but anyway, uh, this, this, this uh, worked and, and, and that was the, the, the main problem. Now, there has been uh, papers by Gu and Zhou who, who uh, generalized this, this, this Ozawa Takagoshi with optimal constant. Uh, and op well, so they main generalize it, but in fact they use essentially the same ODE. So it's also the, the kind of the, the problem reduces to it's different method because they, they had this paper I mentioned at the very beginning, but there is this ingredient from uh, uh, from what I just mentioned is this ODE with two unknowns. This is by translation is essentially the same ODE. And uh, so they also characterized, this was a more detailed question posed by Suita, characterized precisely when there is equality in the Suita conjecture. And this can happen only on exactly uh, for even any Riemann surface in the case where this is by holomorphic to a disk with possibly a closed polar set removed. This is a paper will appear in the Annals of Mathematics. Um, okay, so now let me tell you quickly about a slightly different approach to this. Uh, and this is a, a general lower bound for the Bergman kernel, also in higher dimensions. So the result, the main result is, is the following. So we have for pseudo-convex domains, we have the following lower bound with this precise constant in terms of a now pluricomplex green function. So this is a, a counterpart of this green function I defined at the beginning for domains on the plane, but uh, it, it can, well, it can be defined exactly the same way as they're using the complex Mont-Jamper equation. Uh, 
and, and another possible definition is this. But one of the big differences is usually not uh, symmetric and it's usually not smooth, uh, even for very smooth domains, uh, but nevertheless very useful. And in particular, this result is non-trivial already in dimension one. So for n equal one, this gives you suita conjecture also, just letting t goes to, go to minus infinity. You can show easily that this converges uh, to, to, to this optimal bound. Now, how, how was this at least proved originally? Uh, okay, so using D bar equation that I won't go into details, but this, in this framework I, I mentioned, you can prove certain estimate. Uh, but not with a constant that is not optimal. In fact, this, I, I, I formulated, I think, this precise estimate already in a paper almost, well, that I wrote more than 10 years ago. And, uh, well, the, the constant was precisely as here, but uh, uh, it was uh, improvement of a result by Herbert who, who, who proved in particular this estimate, but, but with, a, with a much worse constant. Uh, but, and then I realized only recently that from this, uh, that what we have now, you can actually get the, the optimal, uh, the optimal uh, constant using something I, I learned from convex analysis, and this is the tensor power trick. Uh, so what you do, uh, you take a collection, well, the, the, the Cartesian product of your domain many times, and, and, and the point, and both the green function and the pluricomplex both the Bergman kernel and the pluricomplex green function behave very well under taking products. So you have these formulas. In fact, well, this formula uh, is a result of uh, Jarnitsky and Fluke for pseudo-convex domains, it uses a complex Mont-Jamper equation, and it's a more difficult proof for arbitrary domains by Edigarian. He here, we, it's enough for us to have it for pseudo-convex domains. And now, you see, you apply the, the previous estimate for, for this domega, domain omega tilde, you get this, this estimate, uh, right? So you take mth root of both sides, and the only thing you have to check is what happens when m goes to infinity, and uh, miraculously it goes to the right constant. So, uh, so, so, so that was... Uh, in fact, uh, something that was enough to, to prove this. Now, there is another approach to, 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 to this theorem. It's a proof uh, due to Lempert. Uh, but maybe I should skip it because, well, I see my... Uh, um, I, and I want to tell you about the, uh, the, the Mahler conjecture. So let me skip this. Sorry. Okay. So let, let me just... Uh, uh, is, uh, mentioned it. So now there are even, you can say, three proofs of the Suita conjecture. The initial one, maybe the most complicated, was the one-dimensional using ODE. There is infinitely dimensional one, so it fin uses infinitely many dimensions using this tensor power trick, and this Lampert proof uses really two dimensions, so, so you have to use uh, uh, C2. And there is a very recent paper by Bernson and Lempert that along this line also prove Ozawa Takegoshi with optimal constant. Uh, okay. Now, uh, the result, I, I, another application of this theorem, and this will be important for me in this last part uh, for the Mahler conjecture, uh, more Burgomimel inequality, is this uh, for convex domains. So when now t goes to minus infinity, 
you can show, well, essentially, that this thing goes to 1 over the volume of the uh, Kobayashi indicatrix. This is the Kobayashi indicatrix. Delta is the unit disk. Um, it's, uh, uh, so it's a, it seems a very, a very accurate estimate. I actually spoke on this particular one yesterday at the sectional talk. Uh, so I think I have to skip this. The, let me only mention on, on, uh, on, uh, that there is a conjecture that this thing is uh, a monotone in T. And we proved with Zvonek using isoparametric inequality that it's true in dimension one. The strange thing is you have to use isoparametric inequality. Uh, and uh, in fact, the, this conjecture in higher dimensions is equivalent to kind of isoparamet complex isoparametric inequality. All right, so now let me go to Mahler conjecture. So that be this most elementary part of my talk. Um, okay, assume, so let me formulate it. Uh, we have a convex symmetric body in Rn, meaning body means uh, compact and non-empty interior. We take a dual, and the Mahler volume is the product of, of the volume of K and, and its dual. Uh, it is a in, it's kind of Banach space invariant. So it's independent of linear transformations and it's independent of the inner product. Uh, so apparently this is a very important notion in the functional analysis of finitely dimensional spaces. Uh, all right, the Blaschke, so everything here is simple in dimension two. Blaschke proved this in dimension three and uh, Santalo in, in general that is maximized by balls. Um, and Saint Ramon proved that only by balls, or up to linear transformations, that is by ellipsoids. And the Mahler conjecture, still open, is that this minimized by cubes. Uh, so in a way, you, you, you suspect that it's biggest when it's a bo the body is the roundest, and the smallest when it's least round. Now, this thing is very, I mean, all works very simply in dimension two. So, so, so it is true in dimension two. Uh, let me show you quickly how it works. So you take, it's enough to prove it for polygons and then approximate. So you take a piece of a polygon, uh, maybe yeah, three edges like this. You draw these two parallel lines this way. And now you, you move this edge here, so that it's or this vertex here, so that you, uh, you will uh, reduce a number of vertices. Uh, so this way you obtain, uh, you obtain a, a, a polygon that is, has the same area, and you can show that uh, the, the area of the dual decreases this way. Okay, that's something you have to do. And you do the same thing on the other side. The, the thing is symmetric, so you do the same thing on the other side. Of the, see, the origin is somewhere here. You do the same thing here. And this way you reduce a number of, uh, of uh, vertices, decreasing the Mahler volume, and you end up with a parallelogram, which is a square and then we have equality. So, well, then we know. So this proves this in dimension two. This approach is completely useless in higher dimension. And one of the difficulties of the Mahler conjecture is that if true, the, the cubes will not be the only minimizers. Uh, so these are the, the suspected minimizers are so-called star hansen lima bodies. So you, you construct them, uh, so you start with an interval, and in higher dimensions, you construct them either taking products of lower dimensional hansen lima bodies or taking the duals. Uh, so if we see how it works, so in dimension two, if we take, for, well, in dimension one, of course, it's an interval. In dimension two, a square is a hansen lima body. If we take a dual, then it's still a square, so, so this is equivalent. Now in dimension three, if we take a cube, uh, okay, it's a Hansen-Lima body, 
But if you take it dual, then it's octahedron. And this is not, this is not equivalent. So it, one uh, part of the conjecture is it is still unknown. In dimension three, these are the only two minimizers. And there are more Hansen Lima bodies in, in higher dimensions. Now there is a very interesting uh, uh, approach of Nazarov, in fact, it, uh, how much time do I, do I have? When will we start? The, at least five minutes, okay. Um, formulation of Nazarov, who, well, maybe this is uh, most interesting. So let me show you uh, the equivalent uh, several complex variables formulation of the uh, Mahler conjecture. Uh, so the idea is to consider the, the, the Fourier transform, or, well, take a, a L2 function on K prime, then its Fourier transform at, at the origin is, is this integral. So by the uh, Schwarz inequality, we have, we have this. A by Plancherel formula, we, we have this equality. And equality holds for when, when this U is constant on K prime. So, but, but these things are really entire holomorphic functions. So these are, uh, well, functions with compact support. So the Fourier transforms are really holomorphic functions. Uh, so this way you can characterize the volume of the dual in a kind of like a, a, like a Bergman kernel thing. Uh, so this is this supremum over a family of uh, entire holomorphic functions where this is exactly the image of uh, this uh, 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 space. And now since this is convex, uh, this can be precisely characterized by the pali wiener theorem. So this family is, is exact, consists exactly of holomorphic functions of uh, uh, of exponential growth that, who, that have this bound, uh, uniform bound on the imaginary axis. Uh, so this way we have kind of got, re we have expressed the volume of the dual by something that doesn't involve the dual. And this means uh, that the, the Mahler conjecture is equivalent to finding the, this, this function from this family with this prescribed value and satisfying this estimate on the real axis. Uh, I think this is the most promising uh, approach. Still, there are some, te I mean, some technicalities, but, but it's just calls for applying Helmander's theorem, definitely. <laughs> but, uh, well, nobody knows how yet, but, but this, I think, is very promising. Now, but there is a weaker formulation, so-called burger mean inequality. Uh, it was proved in 1987. It's a lower bound of this form. So, so in the initial paper, this constant C here was, uh, it was just proof existence of the constant. It was not a quantitative uh, inequality, inequality, quantitative constant. Uh, and since the, the, the Mahler volume of a cube is exactly this, this quotient, uh, the Mahler conjecture is equivalent to proving the, the burger milman inequality with C equal to 1. So far, the best constant known is by Greg Cooperberg, and it's pi over 4. And in this, this paper of Nazarov, he, he, he used Hermander's estimate to prove this with worse constant, but, but, it's, but he, he did manage to, to prove it with some constant using Hermander's estimate. And the way uh, he approached this was uh, take a tube domain in CN, and uh, he proved then both the upper and lower bound for the Bergman kernel. And also well, combining, combining this, he got exactly the, the, the burgan milman with this precise constant. Now, the upper bound was elementary. This followed quite easily from, ingeniously but easily and elementary from this formula, old formula of Rothaus, integral formula for the Bergman kernel in tube domains. Uh, 
And well, the lower bound, as you would expect, was the, the, the less elementary part. Uh, and it, in fact, now with those things we know, in particular this theorem we have with the Kobayashi indicatrix, we can, we can use it to actually simplify this. Uh, the only thing we have to prove extra, but it's not difficult, it's essentially, although it's not phrased this way, contained in Nazarov's paper, is uh, that this indicatrix is contained in uh, constant times the product of the two domains. So if you combine this with this, you immediately obtain that. And I actually suspect that you should the optimal one would be this estimate, but without this two in the power. Uh, this would be optimal because then you would have equality for cubes. However, so that's my last remark. However, one can check that for the, this is the octahedron that we already encountered, that for the octahedron, with this, even if we had this optimal, well, we have strict inequality then. This means the, the taking Bergman kernels does not behave well after undertaking duals. For, for a cube, for the corresponding cube, we have equality here. But if we take its dual, then we don't. It means we lose something. So, so it cannot be proved directly using the Mahler conjecture using Nazarov proof of the Burgermann. But uh, this, this equiv constructing a function not on the tube domain but on the entire space, well, that's equivalent. And uh, I think it's a hopeful approach for, because in convex analysis, well, complex analysis offers in this area two very powerful tools that are unavailable in classical convex analysis. One is Hermander L2 estimate, or so D-bar equation, and this, the second one is uh, so-called Lempert theory. Uh, and, okay, last sentence, it's, it's also very interesting in um, view of recent developments to have some counterpart of this in the compact setting for compact Keller manifolds, but, okay, I, I don't have time to talk about it. Thank you very much.